Mina, Code Bonnois, Jesus Freaking Gamer here, back with more Filled with the Spirit, and this time, it's Sunday. I get to talk for a long time. Let me go ahead and set this beautiful little timer so I don't go over because I do tend to ramble and I keep on going, and today, I can go for a really, really, really long time. So let's talk about a lot of little things and just what, in general, comes to my mind. Because being filled with the Spirit, as I said at the beginning of this series, I want to say it again. And if I didn't say it at the beginning of this series, I said it during um, one of the videos when I was at that Christian camp. I believe that I heard from the Lord that there is hope for this nation if His people will be filled with His Spirit. And then, after being filled with the Spirit, given His weapons, and then we can effectively counter and fight against the things that Satan wants to do in this nation. All the bad ideas that are running rampant, all the sin and immorality that is tolerated, um, even legally at this point, all of these things are things that we can fight against as believers in Christ who live in the United States if we're filled with His Spirit. This is not a flesh and blood battle. Like We're not going out there with knives or daggers or swords or guns or bombs or anything like that. We don't want to kill anybody. We want them to repent of their sins. We want them to believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And the most effective way, I always look in this direction because my Bible is down there. Um, so I'm kind of like, okay, Bible. And I'm like pointing and touching the Bible. Everything that we do is, as Christians, it's a spiritual thing. I understand the necessity for governments to exist and the necessity for there to be physical weapons to defend our borders, for us individually to defend our homes. I get that and I believe in those things. I think those things are biblical and correct. But as Christians, that isn't our, unless, unless we're government officials or in the military, and I would add even if you are a political official, even if you are in the military, that's not our primary battleground. How much better would it be, just for an example, and this, this is slightly off topic, but it's, it's relatively important, so I want to bring this up because it does have to do with being filled with the Spirit and spiritual warfare. How much better would it be for us as believers to pray and intercede for other nations and other peoples, maybe even our enemies that we don't like, to, to not just reason with them, with our officials and our diplomats but, and our ambassadors, but to pray for them and say, God, open their eyes, open our eyes, give both sides wisdom in whatever matter it is, and wage that battle in the spiritual level because, again, I, I really want to emphasize that this is mainly a spiritual battle that we're facing here in America, and the filling of the Spirit is one of the things that we need to win this battle. When people are overcome with greed, with lust, with bitterness, uh, with hate, with racism, with, um, with some kind of territorial mentality, or an us-only mentality. And that does include us Americans as well. The world isn't completely and totally about us, as much as we like to think it is, as much as I myself sometimes kind of live my life like that. Guil guilty as charged. I am proud to be an American. I'm much more proud to be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. I'm much more proud that my name is written in the book of life, and I will choose God over this democracy any day. The majority can be wrong. He never is. What if we fought our battles spiritually, fought against the spirits, the demons. Yeah, I be, Again, I believe all this stuff is real. I believe the spirit world is a real thing. I believe not only God is real, I believe angels and demons are real. I believe God, angels, demons, Satan, they are personally interacting in this world, in our lives. God and his angels are trying to pull us towards Jesus, protect us, heal us, help us to get along. Satan and his demons, they come to steal kill, destroy, lie, deceive, um, return us to a state that is primal, primitive, limited, unfree, bound, captive. Those are the things that Satan and his demons want to do. And they do put thoughts in our head and kind of sway our emotions. I do believe they have the power to do that. And they push us in these directions that are just very, very bad. They're against God. They're against good sense and good judgment. And they're just generally very negative and bad to begin with. What if we fought our battles spiritually and we fought against those horrible ideas and those demons of lust, greed, hatred, et, you know, ad infinitum? And then when, if we win the battle, 
then like our, you know, our government's in talk with another government and both sides realize where they were wrong. They realize you know, what they need to do to help each other out. And then instead of fighting over a resource or fighting over a region, they find a way to coexist. And they, and they both sides say, you know what? We've got a few areas wrong and we need to change the way we're thinking. We need to change the way that we're dealing with this other people group. How awesome would that be? Instead of fighting with, and again, I understand that bullets, guns, knives, bombs are all essential and necessary. And sometimes people are not willing to listen. They're going to attack. They're going to hurt. They're going to invade. They're going to threaten. And at that point, if they're not, if they, if they are so set on a way that's contrary to God, then we've got to defend ourselves. We've got to protect ourselves. How much better would it be, though, if we fought our battle spiritually and then... How many battles that way could be avoided in the natural altogether? If we were filled with the Spirit, if we were spiritually aware of what was going on around us, all of that does begin with being a Christian, and then being filled with the Spirit is a step after that. That, that is something more. So it's not, it's not something quick. It's not something simple. It's building a relationship with God, learning of Him, learning of His ways, getting to know Him better, drawing closer to Him, and being filled with him. So of course, uh, you know, it's hard to apply a principle like this on a national level. That that's a very and that and that that was a huge huge tangent, but it it's hard to do that at a national level. It's a bit simpler to do it on a personal level. When you have conflicts with uh, family members, when you have conflicts with people at your church, friends, People at your workplace. It's a lot, I mean, it's kind of, the way, I, the way I view it is the demons that are afflicting us in our personal lives, they're a lot smaller and easier to tackle than the demons over entire regions or nations. And some people believe in kind of like that whole heavenly hierarchy, whatnot. I, I have no biblical proof. I know there are principalities and powers of the air. That's covered later on in Ephesians. It's covered in the next chapter, actually, chapter 6, talking about the spiritual warfare aspect. Of this, to which I believe that being filled with the Spirit, it's a prerequisite for Christians to win that battle. I do believe that there are things like archdemons over entire regions. They're much bigger boys. They're much bigger hitters. They deal with things on a more national level. I believe there are also angels over nations, over regions, over areas. I would refer to the book of Daniel where it talks about Michael standing up for his people. It's like he was assigned to the nation of Israel. He was assigned to certain territory. And also, the prince of Persia opposed him, or actually opposed the angel who was coming down to speak with Daniel. So based on those scriptures, in Daniel specifically, combined with a bit of Ephesians 6, yeah, I believe in a hierarchy of sorts in the heavenly places amongst the angels and the demons. God's all-powerful. But he waits for us to line up ourselves with him. He waits for us to repent of our sins, to genuinely want to seek him. That's why his ways don't just flourish and his glory doesn't just fill the earth like the water fills the seas. Because he's waiting for us to seek him. He's waiting for us to want to know him. And with that, therein lies the limitation of God, so to speak. He's li he limits himself and he is limited because he chooses to be based on our following him, based on if we are repentant of our sin and based on how much we seek him and want him and desire him in our lives. And if you do want him, if you do want to be close to him, being filled with the Spirit is a part of that, a huge, huge part of that. The, first, the second thing I'm going to look at, so I did... That was, kind of, that was a tangent, but again, I felt it was important. It would be great if we could avoid conflicts with one another, between businesses, even between nations. If we were, again, this applies to Christians. That's why it's harder to apply at bigger levels because you need more believers. And you need unity between those believers. That is another message entirely. But once that happens, once you have Christians united together... And in positions of power, then you can start talking about doing things on a county level, a state level, a regional level, a nation level. 
but you need multiple believers to do that. One believer alone will not be able to do that. That's not how it's going to work. That's, and that, that in and of itself, that's an entirely different message. But I do believe it is possible for the body to, of Christ to come to a point where we are loving each other, where we are seeking God, where we're repentant of our sin, and we are united. And then we can stand up for things that are even bigger than our households, our neighborhoods, even our entire counties or cities. I believe we can stand up for bigger things, but that will require unity in the body first to fight at those bigger levels. You never see anywhere in history, just using a physical example, you don't see one or two men standing up against an entire army. There are no supermen or superwomen down here. We're all humans. We're all equal. And if you want to fight numbers that are huge, yes, one can take on a thousand and two can take on ten thousand. That is mentioned in the Old Testament. And with the power of God in us, we have a lot of power over the enemy and his camp. First and foremost, we use that in our lives to fight our battles. And then after that, once we've won our battles, once our strongholds are torn down, once our ideologies and our worldviews are correct before the Lord, then we unite with others who are also healed and restored and delivered, and we rise up to take ground for the kingdom. But one person isn't going to take on the 10,000. It's going to be the two. And you say, two people taking on 10,000 is pretty ridiculous. Well, it is, and our God can do that. Well, couldn't one person take on a hundred thousand? Well, you, God can do whatever he wants. There's another story in the Old Testament. Google's your friend for all of this, by the way. I, I want to encourage so much research on your part. Please fact check behind me. Please look behind me. But in the book of the Kings, first or second Kings, there's a story where one of the prophets said to the king at the time, there was, a, there was another nation trying to invade Israel, and the prophet said, don't lift a finger. There were so many times in the Old Testament, because war is so much more talked about in the Old Testament, it's easier to use those as examples. There were so many times when God used his people to attack the enemy. There were times when God uh, performed miracles to assist, to assist his army fighting the enemy. There were times when he would put a praise band out before the army, and then as the worship started, the enemy would start attacking themselves and destroy themselves. And then there were times when God would give them a very specific strategy, and just a good old military strategy. And then there was one particular incident, and it's only once according to my knowledge. Now, let that number kind of sink in. It only happened one time where God said, you don't need to lift a finger, you don't need to do a thing. These enemies are going to be dead tomorrow morning. And the next day, over 100,000 people were just dead in their tents. There was no battle. There was no military strategy. There was no angelic intervention, or maybe there was with them killing the enemy. Don't know. It just said, um, from what I recall, it simply says the angel of the Lord went to the enemy camp and slew over 100,000 of the men. There was no, the children of Israel did nothing. But every other time they did something. So God can do whatever he wants. He certainly can. His arm is not limited. He can fight whatever battle he needs to fight. And he's going to win. He created all this and he can uncreate all of it. But nine times out of ten or 99 times out of a hundred. Heck, 999 times out of a thousand, we're going to have our part to play. We're not just going to have this easy, oh, well, that's, that's done. We're, we're finished. Cool. We don't... Thanks, God. You can kind of keep on moving along. Appreciate the hard work you put in there. Really do. Uh-uh. We have to do our part as well. We have, we have a part to play in this battle. We're told to put on our spiritual armor in Ephesians chapter 6 because we need it. There's a fight every day over our souls and over the souls of everyone close to us within our personal sphere of influence and authority. And there's a battle every day for those souls, for your own soul. We have to fight. God's not going to fight every single battle for us. He is certainly capable of fighting and winning every fight on his own, but that's not the point. He wants us to engage the enemy. He wants us to draw close to him. He wants us to fight these battles, to overcome these personal demons, these personal strongholds, and he wants us to win. And a big part of this fight is being filled with the Spirit. Before Ephesians 6, we have Ephesians 5. And we're told to be filled with the Spirit and not to be drunk with wine. And even though it isn't 
in context with um, Ephesians chapter 6, even though it's not directly related to as far as the warfare goes. At the same time, I do believe, and you, you can feel free to disagree with me on this if you believe that I am incorrect, but I believe that being filled with the Spirit is a big part of that warfare. You have His armor, you shoot up your prayers, you have a spirit of thankfulness, you're knowledgeable in His Word, and you're filled with the Spirit. All of these things are interconnected, and I didn't put together a giant list of verses to prove all of this. But if, if we want America to come back, then first off, we need to come back. And a big part of our coming back to God is being filled with His Spirit. If we seek Him, we will find it. Once we seek Him with all of our hearts, with all of our souls, with all of our minds, and all of our strength, we will find Him. He isn't far from us. He's right there next to us. And even though it feels like we're in the dark so often, if we will just reach out our hands, He'll grab a hold of it. He'll reach us. He'll be there with us. But again, it comes back to we have to do our part. We don't just get to sit on our rear ends and watch God just kind of save the day. We're a part of that battle. The Lord comes with 10,000 of His saints. He doesn't just come on the white horse and do the thing on His own. He could, of course He could, but that's not the point. As His children, we have a part not only in the victory, we have a part in the battle. And you want to start that battle off right? You want to begin that battle? You need, not only do you need to be a Christian, first off, you need to be on His side and say, Hey, Jesus, I'm with you. I repent of my sin. You then need to be filled with His Spirit. That was, I <laughs> didn't know that the message would go in that particular direction, but still very important, and I don't, take, I don't take back or regret a word of it. And again, you want to challenge anything that I said, you want more biblical context, hit me up in the description below. Ty yeah, this is typing. That's what that's supposed to be. Type some in the description. Type some, not in the description, only I can type there. Type in the comments below, and let me know what you think. Let me know where you believe I am wrong. Let me know if you think I'm completely and totally insane and that I'm completely delusional and deceived that the whole God thing is a lie. Feel free to leave those comments. I'm completely fine with that. It would be great if you would leave a reason why and then a dialogue could begin. But if you just want to blast me and troll me, that's totally cool too. Totally okay with that. Now, on, on to another point. I feel like a much smaller point at this point. Don't be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. As I talked about briefly in one of my last messages, a lot of the times being filled with the Spirit is compared to, especially in the charismatic circles that I travel into, being filled with wine or being drunk. And I want to look at that real quick. I, I want to take a little bit of time and focus on that particular aspect as well. Do not be drunk with wine. Now, we, we know what being drunk is. For a quick personal delineation, I don't have a problem with drinking. I don't even have a problem with feeling a little bit of a buzz. But once you lose control, once you lose memory, once your inhibitions start disappearing, once you're drunk, and anyone who drinks understands there are, there are multiple levels of drinking and multiple levels of being gone. And the, your mileage may vary. Some people can drink more or less. Some people can drink a whole lot and it doesn't bother them. Some people can take, drink just one beer and they are like gone. I don't think there's anything wrong with a small buzz. I don't think there's any, and I don't think there's anything wrong with drinking in general. Being drunk, losing your control, losing your inhibitions, especially if you lose, if you just drink to pass out or forget your worries, you're missing the point. The grace of God and the peace of God that passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Be filled with the Spirit. Don't be filled with wine. If you want help for this life's problems, ignoring them and pushing them aside and drinking them away, all that's going to do is put off the problem, and by putting it off, you're letting it grow, you're letting it get worse, and oftentimes getting drunk also results in just really really horrible things like domestic violence, abuse, drunk driving in which lives are lost, lives are crippled and maimed. It's not good, okay? It's just not good. And even, and I'm gonna, and to add in as another note, even private drunkenness, if you're completely by yourself, no one's affected, you're not going anywhere, you're still not dealing with the problem. 
You're still not taking care of business. You're, being, you're filling yourself up with something that's not helping. It's dulling your senses, it's dulling your mind, and nothing's changing. The only thing that's changing is your perception of the problem. And you're just, just saying, eh, forget it, who cares? I'm just gonna try my best to forget this problem. And I know that some problems in this life don't go away easily. I know some problems in this life don't go away quickly. And sometimes it's a combination of both. But being drunk is not going to solve those problems. All right? Being filled with the Spirit of God, facing it head on every single day, in all of its darkness, in all of its gruesomeness, in all of its fear, and in all of its despair. Being filled with the Spirit of God, equipping yourself with His armor and His weapons. Yeah, it's going to be a rough battle, but I promise you it's going to be worth it. It really is. This life has several points that aren't easy and aren't fun to face, and they're very scary. But we're not going to get anywhere by getting drunk, by ignoring our family, by playing video games, by watching TV, by watching sports. By, by just letting life pass us by. That is not solving the problem. Just to use that really old quote, evil triumphs when good men do nothing. Every single one of you can be a good man and a good woman. By coming to Christ, acknowledging you're a sinner, by being filled with His Spirit, and by gearing up for battle. That's how we be good men and women. That's how we win this thing. Not by being drunk or being obsessed with anything else and ignoring our problems. Be filled with the Spirit, not drunk with wine. And which is dissipation? I want to focus on that word dissipation real quick. Now, dis anything that is dissipating is something that it... Think of kind of like um, an evaporation effect. It's just kind of disappearing slowly. That's what dissipation is. And, you, and for those of you who get drunk and get hungover, you're very thankful for the dissipation. Um, you, want that, you want that horrible hungover state to dissipate and disappear. And drunkenness itself also, even if you took away the hangover, you took away the vomiting, you took away the unpleasantness, you took away the headache, the drunkenness itself, it dissipates. It goes away. It fades away. It doesn't stay. And that's just the English word involved. So drunkenness doesn't solve anything. When you look into the Greek word, I looked it up. I did not make note of the spelling or the um, Strong's number. Um, so for, please forgive me for that, but I did look up the sh what the word that Strong used to a synonym that was used uh, in the King James Version, and it's a word called profligacy, P-R-O-F-L-I-G-A-C-Y. Now this is much more than dissipation. In the Greek, um, just to give you some things, it's a noun, and the three definitions are shameless dissoluteness, reckless extravagance, great abundance. Whereas the English, the New King James word for dissipation speaks of something that's slowly disappearing, slowly going away. Whereas profligacy, you're just like, you're throwing it all in there. You're just, it, it's like literally YOLO. Just I'm going to do whatever the heck I want. I'm going to throw it all away. I'm going to do exactly as I please and just, you know, Everything just thrown into the wind. You know, whatever happens, happens. Uh, as a person who plays things relatively safe, just a personal thing, that scares the heck out of me. I don't like the thought of doing that at all. But being drunk with wine, that's essentially what it is. You're just kind of throwing everything to the wind. You're just like, whatever. Who cares? I'm not going to deal with it. Probably going to make it worse. But as long as I don't have to face it head on. I don't care. But be filled with the Spirit. This verse, already covered in a previous message, how being filled with the Spirit results in action, and therein lies the differentiation between being drunk and being filled with the Spirit. When you are drunk, you're ignoring the problem, you're just you're throwing everything to the wind, you're YOLOing, you don't care. Things not gonna get any better, go away. When you are filled with the Spirit, you are equipping yourself for action. You are ready to go. It is go time. 
It, being filled with the Spirit is the exact opposite of being drunk. Your mind is clear. Your senses are enhanced. You're filled with His Spirit. You're ready to move in the gifts of the Spirit. You're ready to walk in the fruit of the Spirit. You're ready to walk in the Spirit, period. You're ready to live for Jesus. Huge difference in mindset. Whereas the world tries to forget its problems, doesn't want to face them, just wants it all to go away. As believers in Christ, we have the power to change this world. And not just with good ideas and just being kind to one another. God's real. Being filled with His Spirit is a real personal experience. And it's a supernatural indwelling and infilling, and it's something that changes your life day by day by day as you are continuously filled with Him, with His Spirit. So that's the juxtaposition that was originally going to be my main point, um, and instead I kind of hopped on the whole warfare part first. In order to engage in that warfare, you need to be filled with the Spirit first. And in order to be filled with the Spirit, you need to have Jesus in your life. A lot of you guys are suffering, like I said earlier. You're in the middle of some bad stuff. You're facing some bad things. I like to think that the majority of you aren't facing things that are that horrible. They're just kind of pesky annoyances day in and day out. And golly day, I wish I could, you know, take care of this. Or, you know, man, I'm having a really hard time liking, you know, Joe at work. He's just, he's a pain in the rear end. He's just a nasty person. I don't like him very much. I'd like to think it was something small like that. But a lot of you guys are facing the divorce of your parents. If you're old enough, your own personal divorce. You've lost a son or a daughter. You just got bad news. You just got really horrible news that someone you love is in a car accident and they're in the ICV right now. Or ICU, sorry. And your whole life is just twisted upside down. And regardless of what your escape is, be it drunkenness, video games, YouTube, whatever it is, only Jesus can really give you an answer for that. And only He can equip you to face those things head on. I'm not going to say it's going to be easier. I'm not going to say it's going to, I'm not necessarily going to say that some miracle is going to save that person or they're going to rise from the dead. I'm not even going to say the marriage is going to be brought back together and healed. I can't promise those things. I don't know. I can promise you that He will be with you as you're filled with His Spirit and as you let Him guide you. If you will accept Him as your Lord and Savior, He will help you through those hard times. He won't make them go away, but He will equip you to deal with it in whatever capacity you need. His grace is sufficient and His Spirit is all-powerful. That doesn't mean He wipes away all of our problems. That means we put on His armor, we shoot up our prayers, and we go to battle, believing in Him to help us along the way. And if you would like to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior right now, all you need to do is tell Him that you're sorry for the sins you've committed, you believe that He died on the cross shedding His blood to forgive you of those sins, and that He rose three days later, guaranteeing you eternal life. That, that's what it takes. That's step number one. You become a Christian. You submit your life to God. And if you would like a model prayer to follow, if you would like something more specific and more set in stone, I'll pray a prayer real quick. Repeat these words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner. I need your help. Like This life is hard, and I can't do it. And the alcohol, the video games, sex, drugs... None, none of these things are, are hitting the spot. None of these things are healing the problem. None of these things are healing the hurt. So I'm asking you to help. I admit I've messed up. I've done wrong. I've sinned against you. But I believe that you came down here on earth as Jesus. And that you personally died for me on the cross. Shedding your blood so my sins could be forgiven. And I believe that you didn't just stay dead but that you're alive now and that you're hearing me. And that you're saving me as I ask you to. Thank you, Jesus, so much. I commit to living the rest of my life for you. Help me. Help me. Help me with the hard time I'm going through. Fill me with your spirit. 
Give me your weapons and your armor so that I can do what you want me to do in this really horrible situation. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you prayed that prayer, congratulations. You are a member of the kingdom of God. You're his son. You're his daughter. He's always loved you. But now you've, you've accepted that love into your own heart. You've accepted it for yourself. You've embraced it. Continue to embrace it. That doesn't mean the, the, the bad situation is going to clear up tomorrow or next week or next month or next year. It means that you aren't just throwing this thing to the side. You're not just doing your, be you're not just doing your best to ignore it, wipe it under the rug, draking your problems away. It means you face it head on. And go to a church. Find other people who believe the same thing as you, that the Bible, I want to pick it up even though it doesn't really matter, but that the Bible is the Word of God, that God speaks through this Word. They believe prayer works. They believe that Jesus is God, that He came in the flesh, that He died and rose again, just like you believe. Find like-minded people who will help you, who will pray with you. Remember that thing, that unity I was talking about earlier? Get other Christians to unite with you in prayer over this horrible thing that you're facing. And you want to know something? Even though it doesn't happen every time, and even though I'm not guaranteeing anything, God can and does still perform miracles. And He, I'm not just talking about, you know, a, a bunch of nice people trying to do nice things to make the world a better place. I'm talking about a supernatural God who miraculously intervenes and helps His people in their times of greatest need. I have seen it with my own eyes. I've seen what He's done for me, and I've seen what He's done for other people. There is someone out there watching over us. And He is, loves you and He is for you and His name is Jesus. And He's just waiting for you to come to Him and say, Daddy, I need help. And I admit that I'm a sinner and I need help for me first. That's where the whole thing begins. Guys, thank you very much for watching this. Hopefully this ministered to some hearts. Don't know how much longer the Filled with the Spirit Spheres will continue. It'll continue as long as I think I have something relevant to say and something uh, that I haven't said before. Although and at some point in the future, I'm sure I'll repeat a lot of my stuff over and over again. But right now, there's a lot of new stuff I want to talk about and a lot of new ground I want to break. So once again, thank you guys very much for watching this video. I love you and God bless.